Welcome to the Resilient Retail Game Plan, a podcast for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable creative product business with me, Catherine Erdley. The Resilient Retail Game Plan is a podcast dedicated to one thing, breaking down the concepts and tools that I've gathered from 20 years in the retail industry and showing you how you can use them in your business. This is the real nuts and bolts of running a successful product business, broken down in an easy, accessible way. This is not a podcast about learning how to make your business look good. It's the tools and techniques that will make you and your business feel good, confidently plan, launch and manage your products, and feel in control of your sales numbers and cash flow to help you build a resilient retail business. Welcome. It is episode number 135 of the Resilient Retail Game Plan, and I'm your host, Catherine Erdley, as well as the founder of the Resilient Retail Club and the author of Tame Your Tiger, my new book. You can find out more at resilientretailclub.com. And today I am joined by Cara Benden, who's a brand consultant. Have you ever wondered about your branding? Have you ever wanted to improve it, change it? Maybe you're in the process or have just gone through a rebrand or created a brand? If so, you'll know that branding is a huge topic and it covers so many different things from how your customers think about you, speak about you, how they choose when they see your products on the shelves and so much more. It's an absolutely fascinating topic that covers everything from consumer psychology to colour theory and everything in between. And I'm delighted to be joined by Cara today. I think you're really going to enjoy today's conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Cara. Do you want to start off by introducing yourself? Thanks so much. Yes, my name is Cara Benden and I am a brand consultant. So basically, I have a small team of fantastic brand designers that I work with. And since 2013, we've been working with small businesses on their branding. Fantastic. And you and I, I I was actually trying to remember how we met and I can't quite remember, but we've been talking since what's probably since 2019 for sure definitely before the pandemic yeah I think we were both working with Tabara oh yes launch oh my goodness I think it's a little earlier even (laughs) that that we became connected oh my goodness yes because so Tabara from Labaskitry which by the way if you don't know Labaskitry definitely go check them out because what she does is amazing But that was when I very first started my business back in 2018. And I just had no idea if anyone even needed what I knew or anything. And I put out a call in the Noi Facebook group, which I was in, which was a networking group, which was fantastic. I actually made loads of great connections in that group. So I said, does anybody want me to come and talk to them just basically just have a chat with you about your business? And Tabara was one of the very first people that I had a conversation with. And that was like the start of me realizing that my knowledge was useful to small businesses. So, wow, that does go way back then, all the way back to the beginning. That's 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 fantastic. And one of the first product businesses I worked with as well, La Basketry. And um, definitely, I remember Tabara actually saying how useful you were and saying, I've got someone you need to meet, Cara. So <laughs> I think that's how it was. <laughs> the beauty of networking. I love it. So let's talk about branding then, because this is such a huge topic. And obviously for a product business where product is everything, we should also say as well that you do specialize in product businesses and you've been working more and more with them. Exactly. You know, in a nutshell, one of the things I find so appealing about branding is that it isn't just about pretty shapes or colors. It's visual, but it's psychology. It's actually consumer behavior. So that's why I really get a kick out of working with small business brands and basically with product and lifestyle brands, because they are the brands that are talking directly to their audience Mm -hmm. rather than say B2B, which is more corporate business to business. So for me, those brands that compel you enough that you give them a shot, that you try them, that you tell your friends about them and the whole journey and everything involved in that process is what really interests me. So that's the bit that you really love about it in terms of the psychology, but can you tell us a little bit more about how branding psychology works in a nutshell for product businesses? Well, ultimately we are bombarded with so many different brands in the course of a day. There've been 
studies saying it's a thousand. There's been studies saying it's 10,000. We don't really know at this point with social media, everybody's habits mean that they see different amounts. But what is known is that we are completely over overwhelmed with different brands and colors and names throughout the day. So it's about cutting through, really. It's about being able to stand out above that and speak, you know, speak up through the noise. And that is a really challenging thing to do. But time and time again, especially because we have so much noise, we are drawn to the brands that do feel like they speak to us. The the brands who they have values that we have in common and we feel that they reflect that in their, the way they run their company, the way they make their products, the way they market to us. That tells us that we have a point of connection with them. And then, you know, that makes it a lot less noisy out there for us being able to trust brands. And I mean, also just then it saves us time. And that's a really practical part of brands that is so important is reputation. Once you know that you can trust a product or a brand, it's no longer a risk purchasing it. You're more likely to repurchase it, to tell others and just to purchase it without really giving it much thought. Whereas at the beginning, when you're finding out about a brand, you're really scrutinizing it. But then once you know, you know, like and trust it, you can buy from that brand. Even if they branch out to other things, it's likely you're going to like it. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Very randomly, I was having this, this is kind of relevant. It's kind of a bit random, but we were having this, we were joking. I, I think I had the most middle class problem ever the other day which was that Ocado substituted Molden <laughs> instead of instead of sending me Molden sea salt flakes they sent me Molden pepper grinder instead so we were joking about this I was joking about this with my family about how this was such a ridiculous problem to have my son my 15 year old said to me well you know what it's a very weird thing to do isn't it if you you know because sea salt and pepper is very different ways that you obtain them right you know sea salt you get from evaporation and pepper comes from you know pepper pepper bushes whatever it is um I'm showing my ignorance here but the point was I said to him well it's molden because you know molden sea salt has such a strong it's exactly what you're saying there about the trust right if you trust molden implicitly for their sea salt which is fantastic then you can extend that brand to be pepper because it's yes okay it's a very different way of it's a very it's a very different way of obtaining it but what they've got there is then the trust as a trusted seasoning if you like yeah exactly I I can imagine it was pretty annoying (laughs) (laughs) especially if you already (laughs) had some (laughs) I was annoyed and then I was like you know this is the most ridiculous thing in the world to get annoyed about though and we had a good laugh but it was yeah but yeah exactly that (laughs) You are right, because it is that um, thing of thinking, well, it isn't the item I ordered, but at least I know it will be good quality when I do run out of pepper. Right. Yes, exactly. And that's that's why Molden would ever bother doing that. Right. Because they've presumably looked at their main asset, their brand and thought, well, how can we extend this? Exactly. As you said, where have people built up this level of trust and level of belief in us? There's no like and trust factor that we can then extend it. And that all comes back to the branding. Yeah, it's so interesting the way your son was looking at the science of how it was <laughs> yes. brought about. I would never think to do that. Because, um, yeah, I would just think, oh, Molden, oh, it's, the brand is almost like a trusted chef's best friend. Yeah. Know that they're there. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did have a range of, you know, maybe spices or various different seasons. Yeah. Um, that would be fully within their brand for me rather than thinking that they are yeah exactly like chipping it off salt blocks (laughs) yes but I think that that's what's so fascinating about branding for me is that as you said it's that trust and also I was thinking about this when I was preparing for this this recording and I was thinking very randomly again I love love how all my um, examples are food-based but I was thinking about this peanut butter because uh, we discovered a new brand of peanut butter it's called heart and soul peanut butter in instantly if you're interested uh, that we get from the local crystal palace food market which I absolutely love is amazing Uh, but prior to that we got this we were saying oh yeah we got that other one from the supermarket and I thought to myself I cannot for the life of me remember the name of this brand but if I saw its tin in a lineup or its jar in a lineup, I definitely would recognize it from the colors and from the branding. So uh, do you think it's possible that branding can be even more important than a name? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that the visual component of branding is the most immediate 
part of a of a product that people mm. will see so you know whether it's more important is arguable but it's certainly something they're going to their brain's going to address sooner so you know before they've even read the label they're going to read in the colors and the shapes of the packaging and you know um you and I were chatting another time about um own brand knockoffs and how you could sometimes come out from your weekly shop with the yes. wrong brand because it's they're so cleverly trying to imitate a, a better known brand's packaging say yes you know marmite or like yeast extract and they will have similar colors in their packaging and that's fully intentional so yeah absolutely I mean the brain will read color first Mm. and then make sense of the name but often when we are rushing around and there's so many other brands we're not reading the labels at all and yeah actually the color psychologist Karen Haller said that up to 85 percent of our first impression is made up from color Mm. so it's very important that's incredible and also I suppose what we're talking about here as well is we're talking about split second decision right so you of course talk about shelf appeal I'd love for you to talk more about what that means but just to kind of put that in context, we are talking about people making decisions based on branding, you know, in, in split seconds, right? We are and we're not. It really depends. Okay, it interesting. Depends what <laughs> item where right. it's being sold. I mean, for example, I mean, online, there's, you know, it's well covered that you need to quickly grab people's attention, that attention spans are very short, et cetera, et cetera. And decisions are generally made quite quickly and quite impulsively but sometimes we're seeking out emotional solutions um, from products sometimes we're going to a shop to cheer ourselves up or sometimes when you're you've pretty much completed your food shop you have a wander through and you might pick something as a little treat to yourself for having done the chore so sometimes, yes, and it would depend. So I'd say, you know, unless you're a cleaning fanatic, you're probably going to be quite functional about these decisions about, you know, what laundry detergent you get, et cetera, et cetera. But there'll be certain things. Maybe there'll be if a brand has released a new type of biscuit, and especially if the, the shop has put that on display, then you might linger a bit more. And the other thing as well is I'm speaking in a sort of analogy of a supermarket but if we take that to a small business, like like your Crystal Palace food market, mm. you're there to browse. Mm. So actually, it's turned around. You might think to yourself, I'm going to buy one thing today just because I like to buy one thing each week that I come. You know, it might not be in order. It's not for pure sustenance that you are going there. It's because you want to pick out something pretty, something delicious, something lovely, something you can try. Yeah, for sure. That's fascinating. So there'll be different speeds for different reasons. But let's bring it back then to this shelf appeal. So you, you, because you talked about the importance of standing out uh, on a crowded shelf. So what exactly is shelf appeal when it comes to products? And how do you know if you've got it? Oh, that's a oh, good question. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, well, I'd say that if we go back to that example of knockoff own brands, what they are doing is they are riding off the back of a well-known brand's mm. colouring and they're not taking any identity for themselves, whereas actually that does result in sales, but it doesn't result in any brand recognition because there is no brand. They are just trying to be an imitation. Mm. Where you want to be known as a brand, standing out is really important. Mm. It's about catching the eye, really. It's the fact that, again, we see so many things and the brain is just, we are drawn to pretty things. I know, I well, I certainly am. I'm, <laughs> I know that I have unusual consumer behavior because of the work I do, but I mean, I'm a sucker for beautiful packaging. Something I recently found out actually in, um, in preparation for this talk was that actually if somebody picks an item off the shelf, they're 80% more likely to buy it if they oh, pick it and look at it. So yes. that's fascinating to me. Yes. I think for me, one of the interesting examples of branding that I experienced recently was that I went to to Stylist Live. Well, it was a while ago now, I guess it was back in November. And they had a brand there called So Vital, S-O-W-V-I-T-A-L, which I've actually got right here. So of course, this is a podcast, you can't see it, but I'm just showing Cara (laughs) the, the bottle. But what's so funny about this brand is that I totally know what they're doing and I love it anyway, which is that they've taken plant care products. So they've got a house plant spritz, 
an aqua leaf cleanser and a houseplant elixir. And what they've done is instead of it being packaged like, you know, baby bio or something like that from the garden centre, they've actually packaged it. And so it's got green frosted glass. It's got a black pump um, or a dropper. We've even got a pipette on one of them um, and a lovely label and everything else. And and they've they've taken a reference from luxury skincare, so bath oil and that kind of thing. So it just feels very, very fancy. And it, I thought it was, I was so sort of taken with it because, of course, I love my plants. And uh, and I asked my husband if I could have I was like, I'm going to put that on my Christmas list because and it's funny because, I you know, I know enough about product and branding to know exactly what they're doing. But I just love it anyway. Do you, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I love that. I, exactly. When you showed me, I was like, yeah, skincare. This is yeah. genius. So that's the yeah. kind of thing I would work with my clients and say, you know, when sometimes this is why if we just look at our own sector or whatever, you could be a little bit limited. Mm. If you, And sometimes I even notice with branding, a lot of people, when they're setting up a business, they have a subliminal desire to look like other brands yeah. in that business. I mean, even you will see things like design contests for skincare brand logo or whatever, and they'll all look very much of a muchness. Mm. And that's because you're pointing them in that direction. But if you were looking at it differently and looking at the shelf, looking at the consumer and looking at the USP of the the product and saying how can we bring these things together to actually stand out rather than try to emulate because it's like the millennial pink obviously it's really hugely successful for some brands like glossier but yeah. other brands would be forgotten in the mix because color can be a really valuable trigger for people to remember brand names when they're distinct enough but when there's a lot in that space we haven't got the the, the memory or to remember them all it's when we're coming across so many so i love taking inspiration from one industry and applying it to another I'm trying to think of an example where we've done that but definitely I love exactly what what that brand has done is fantastic because who says that things have to be a certain way who says yeah. that garden things have to look like plastic package bottles that have cautions about you know the yeah. for when you for the garden shed who yeah. says that because it's a new generation of plant owners who want them to be aesthetic and beautiful indoors they care about them so why not reflect that in the approach of the brand? Yeah, for sure. And I and the fact I am happy to have them sit out on my windowsill and look at it. You know, it's it's quite pleasing to look at, to be honest. So it's not kind of been put away. So I think, yeah, I think it's it's just fascinating. All of this part, and it's all as you said, it comes back to the psychology, doesn't it? What what it triggers in us that emotional response. I always remember when I worked in the corporate world, we used to have one buying director who whenever we were looking, we'd have to spend hours and hours in these range reviews where you basically have all of the clothing racked up around the room and you're making decisions and saying yes, no to various different things. And we would have a buying director and she would always say like, it has to have this response like in sharp yeah. intake of breath like emotional must have sometimes we'd be like can you please quantify that you know because of course especially for me like from the numbers side okay all right well I, I need a bit more to work with than that but that's effectively it with branding right Don't, do you think that it's you want some kind of emotional response yeah definitely I mean absolutely the less essential the product the more emotive the brand experience needs mm. to be <laughs> that's a great that's a great point yeah for sure <laughs> yeah, absolutely because it's like you know I don't know washing up liquid or toilet roll there's a certain amount that there are there's choice there of course there's choice with everything but there's a it's not as vital to you or I don't know even something more like say you needed a spirit level you're going mm. to go to the hardware shop and you don't care what brand it is because you need that item mm. but when it comes to a notebook yes you need a notebook but what's it going to look like or if you're if you are say yeah you want that that idea of treating yourself if I was to go into like one of the lovely little shops they used to have in like on the Bellenden Road in Peckham or in Clapham. yeah and I'm picking an independent brand, I'm basically just picking something to give me a pick me up that day, you know, like a lovely jam that has a really interesting ingredient list and, and, and custom illustration on the label or something like that. Even for buying for gifts is actually about the experience that we have purchasing it because mm. it gives you anticipated joy 
knowing that it's really lovely. And it also makes our life easier. If we think something looks beautiful already, we don't have to sort of, we don't have to gift it with a proviso of, oh, I know it doesn't look that great, but trust me, it's really good stuff. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's, we know that we're having that experience when we buy it. And then if we gift it, it's, we know it's presentable. It's going to be a nice gift for them. That's going to pass on. Absolutely. I I love that. It's interesting uh, as well, though, because we talked a lot about the appearance of the brand, but how much do you think that the consumer's experience that they have with you as a business also contributes to this idea of what makes the brand? Oh, hugely, hugely. I mean, mostly with my team, we work on equipping the brands we work with, with the visual assets, but we do also work on tone of voice. And something I'm very big on is little touches, just good customer care really Mm. it's it's making sure that people are having a quite cohesive experience from coming across your brand if they came across your brand in person or via a leaflet then the reaching your website needs to marry up with that sort of expectation the reason that I talk about color and and form and logos in general so much is just because they are the visual markers that help tell our brain very, very quickly. Yep, you're in the right place. Yeah, and that's really important. Yep, you're in the right place. Yep, that's the brand. That's the one. Because that reassurance point is something that our brain seeks very quickly. So once we've covered that, you know, and that's why consistency is so important. Mm. And that doesn't mean never changing. It just means making it very clear that a person signposted from one thing to another. They're all the same brand. Yes, you're in the right place if you're looking for whatever your product might be. Do you know, it's interesting you say that because I was just thinking about this the other day that I was looking for a website or I was looking for a brand and then I found them and then I wanted to find them on Instagram as well. I can't remember why. I was sort of a bit of, you know, light cyber stalking as you do. (laughs) And then I was putting in the name and it was something reasonably generic. So it wasn't like a one-off name that only they would have anything like it. But then in order for me to make sure that I'd got the right one, I was definitely checking the low, like, is the logo on Instagram the same as the logo on the website or the, you know, like I, I needed that point of connection because yes, of course, it'd be great if everyone's Instagram handle was exactly the same as their website URL, but we know that's not the case. So I, I was just reflecting on how much, like you say, they are, it is a hook that hooks the two together that we do like to, to often we do bounce around the online space when we're researching somebody or looking into someone or understanding if they're the right person for you to buy from or work with, for example, then you definitely need that branding to pull those different bits together. And also the fact that I don't know if anyone else is this, but I quite often find if I click on somebody's Instagram link from their website, inst- it goes through to Instagram, it says this link doesn't work or something. I don't know why it happens on loads. So obviously it's not their website. It's obviously something with Instagram being weird, but you know, you, you can't always directly yeah. go from one place to the other. And it's the branding that helps you hook, hook it together to understand that it's the same person, the same company that you're dealing with. Yeah, I think it's essential. It's essential. And I mean, and I'll come back to your point in a second about, you know, the rest of the the business behavior in general. But on the visual side, it's just about if you imagine that nobody that you have never seen the social media feed or the website of the brand before. And if the website's really beautifully designed and slick and then your social media is just your face, but there isn't your brand anywhere on the Mm. highlights or the brand color, it could be hard for people to understand. So obviously I know most product businesses wouldn't really do that. They would have a mix of content that would be their product, their brand colors, their packaging, and, you know, user generated content or lives or Q and A's about the product. And that's fine, but there just needs to be something that looks like the brand, you know, and conversely, if it's too dead, it's not going to look very active, but it's having a bit of both so that, yeah, it's, I think Instagram, social media is a very valuable channel in us understanding the brand a bit more these days. And I mean, in terms of the brand experience, you know, it's the basics of a, an easy to use, user friendly website with not too many clicks and procedures and forms while you buy and then friendly, helpful updates once you have ordered that actually help you get excited about your order like I ordered pajamas from their nibs and then it was said something like yay your pajamas are on their way you know (sighs) at the time I think it was during the the post strike so it was like a two to three week wait but even you know just it's, it's very very minor details like tone of voice rather than just it's been dispatched 
help create that excitement, which is part of the emotional part of purchasing. And it's important. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting, actually, because last week I did a a few weeks ago, actually, I did a talk for eBay. And uh, so everyone in the audience was an eBay seller. And I was talking about the importance of really good customer service. And one of the questions I got asked at the end was, "Okay, so it's great, you know, the idea of building a business and building repeat customers. But, you know, if you're on a marketplace, can you do that? And I or is it only something you can do if you've got your own website? Now, personally, I always believe you should have your own website as well as being on a marketplace. Marketplaces can be great additional income streams but it it is harder but what I I said to them was yeah it's it's obviously more challenging when you can't control the experience and obviously visually it's very difficult but you know you can through your packaging through and also exactly that through your user experience if the customer has a really great experience with you I know for a fact there are eBay sellers that I go back to I'll look I'll look up a specific eBay store because I've had a good you know they have good products and they arrive on time and they're friendly, useful updates. And of course it's harder because people are searching for a product, but it's not impossible. Even on the third party website, obviously much, much easier to do if you're selling direct. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I've had really good experiences with Etsy sellers. Mm. One time a lady's small printing business really got me out of a fix where I wanted to get some tissue paper branded for a client photo shoot. And, you know, I had because I I turned to something like Etsy because I wanted just a small amount. but I also wanted to be able to speak to somebody directly. Mm. So customer service is actually quite a strong driver in the decision. And um, I'd asked if she could do it within three days or four days. And she did it within a day. Wow. It really blew me away. And of course, I've got her in my mind if I ever need anything like that again. So I know that sustainable conscious branding is something that you're really passionate about. Uh, I'd love to just touch on this sort of potential paradox. And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this. This idea about. Yeah, that's so true. I think that over the last sort of 10 years or so, as social media has grown and grown, the unboxing experience has become something that we actually come to expect, really. And um, we feel a bit shortchanged when we just shake out a brown envelope and get the item on the table. And that's that, you know, maybe with a receipt or a, you know, delivery note. But on the other hand, Some of those um, unboxing experiences that I've enjoyed in the past, you know, where you come to with ever learning knowledge about how to be better for the planet and you realize, oh, well, it did make me feel amazing in that moment. But now I've got, you know, lots of pieces of lots of leaflets, pieces of paper and tissue paper and stickers all branded. So I'm never going to use them again because I don't want to package things with brand names you know, and and that it all goes straight in the recycling and that it's actually quite anticlimactic. Mm. I think this is fascinating. And it's something like you said, that I'm growing my knowledge of at the moment. But I think that there's an opportunity here to do both, to do it, to find ways to use minimal packaging in ways that have maximum impact, to question what's necessary to use materials that are more eco-friendly. And and by that, I don't just mean make everything recyclable, because obviously that's still producing it all just to go straight in the recycling bin. Mm. Some brands really do well with this in terms of being quite ingenious about the materials. So there's there's anything you could go for some crazy materials like um, plantable cards and things like that, which could really suit a brand. But then you've got to think about how likely is it that your customer would take that action with Lucy and Yak. I love that they use off cut fabric to mm. make pouches for their items. And then those pouches don't have any branding on. They're all different patterns. Then they, you know, they encourage you as well on your social media to say what you might reuse it for. Obviously, recently, there's been a growth in interest of not using paper, wrapping paper for Mm. gifts. So a lot of people said they use it for that. Other people were using it for socks or toys or whatever. And that was great. And I think that the real breakthroughs here are where we can reduce and and encourage true reuse. So, you know, and that is difficult because obviously as a brand, you want to put your brand on everything and you you can if that isn't going to inhibit somebody from reusing it. But it's an interesting dilemma for brands to think in that space. But I think that 
because it's all so new as well, or we're in this sort of period of changing attitudes and awareness, that this is an opportunity for your brand to really stand out. Because at the moment, while there are a few brands that are doing exceptionally well, most people are in the in-between phase. I mean, certainly I think it's good to be plastic free and, you know, kind of go for those basics. But if it's something that is integral to your brand values, and we know that it's a growing importance to consumers, then this can be a really nice way to leave a big impression, especially, you know, for an e-commerce business where everything's been online so far, your first in-person interaction with them, Mm. you know, and it can be simple, as simple as little things like when Etsy, where they tell you that the shipping's been offset, Mm. that makes you feel good when you receive the package. Yeah. There's another example I was looking at, which is Rothy's, which is, they're a brand that makes shoes out of plastic bottles, recycled plastic Mm. bottles, made by pumps. And they, so they've obviously invested quite a bit in this packaging, but they've got a beautiful box that feels very unboxing, but it's actually the mailer. So there's, it's one and the same Mm. and it's lightweight. So that means that it's requiring less you know, um, in postage, it has less carbon footprint as it's in transit. But it also means you get this nice looking um, shoebox, but it also is just the the mailer says not an additional piece required. So that's a really good sort of mix there between what branding means in terms of experience for the customer and beliefs and values and what it means for, like you say, the Lusignac off cart bag, it does not say Lusignac on it. So it's branding without the branding being specifically the logo and the colors, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of the whole experience. Yeah. And I mean, there's other brands. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how Supreme do their packaging, honestly, but like there are some brands that their whole brand, all of their merch is their logo. Yeah. And so in that case, if your if your hoodie came in a tote that had that on, you'd be very likely to use that tote because it's very similar and aesthetic to the item that you bought. Mm. It's just knowing whether people would, you know, reuse something or not if it's branded. And I mean, um, if, for example, so if I had ordered my beauty pie order and I, their packaging's fantastic, lovely unboxing, mm. but the tissue paper's all branded. So even I found I couldn't reuse that when I was gifting and I like to be able to reuse tissue paper. I like to reuse where I can to just, you know, reduce environmental impacts. And so, and that was something that I thought because they, I held onto the boxes for a few months, actually, because I thought they were so beautiful, but I just couldn't think of another use for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How to make it kind of multifunctional and try and get some circularity into it, the reuse and element. And I mean, that's at the upper end of things. I think doing anything towards that helps, but I think that that's a really fun and also difficult challenge but I think that's a really good place to start thinking there that that opportunity that it allows so if someone's listening to this podcast and we've managed to convince them that branding and and they want to improve their branding the shelf appeal everything else they think okay this is an area that I need to have a look at where would you suggest starting even you know where do you even begin in general branding doesn't have to be too complicated and you, there's a lot of fantastic information on the internet. If you were to Google, you know, um, essentials for small business branding, things like that, you don't need to feel like, you know, you are getting lost in jargon or anything like that. Branding is actually quite simple. And I think for me, what matters most is always looking at the, the specific product or brand in front of you and the any, you know, anything, the story of how you came to create that is very important what you know what landscape you're up against so you know you might not want to use the word competitors but who else could your customers buy from and why they should buy yours instead and really that's the heart of most of the exercises we would do so uh, I would say sort of starting at the core of understanding your you know your reason for being the story of how you set up and why others should buy you over others is going to be really critical to your brand. And if they want to work with a brand consultant, then can you tell us more about how they can find out more about you? 
Yes, absolutely. So, of course, that would be my other suggestion because I can't <laughs> just distill it all in a sentence. But it, it is a bespoke process and that's it. So every time we look at things, you know, case by case and really go into detail of the ideal client and things like that. So, yeah, you can find me at carabenden.com. I'm on Instagram, um, just at, at carabenden and on LinkedIn as well. And yeah, there's lots of resources on our blog with um, different aspects of branding, such as how to pick a name or brand colors and the importance of standing out. And of course, we work one on one. Thank you so much for tuning in. Why not head over to Resilient Retail Club on Instagram and let me know what you thought of the episode and if there are any key takeaways for you. Did it make you think differently about your own brand? I also love, love, love to see it when you share photos of where you're listening to the podcast. So do feel free to tag me when you're listening. If you rate and review the podcast in iTunes and it absolutely makes such a difference, you can even rate the podcast as well in Spotify inside the app. And of course, if you subscribe in iTunes or follow in Spotify, then you'll be the first to know about every new episode. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, then I invite you to check out resilientretailclub.com. The Resilient Retail Club is the membership for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable product business. No more trawling Google trying to find the answers to your questions or wading through general business advice that speaks mainly to service-based businesses. Whether you're still at the idea stage or you've been going for a while but want to get more focused and organised when it comes to your business, the Resilient Retail Club is the place for you. With a library of courses tailored to creative product businesses, several live sessions a month and a supportive and active community, The Resilient Retail Club is the perfect membership to help you hit your goals faster. Check it out at resilientretailclub.com.